So we talk about in um, rowing literature these seven golden tests, if you like, to try and figure out whether someone has a bony injury or whether it's um, chest wall related pain. And this came from a Brains Trust at the AIS in 2006 or seven, sitting down and going, what are the tests that we actually think are most important when we're trying to figure out whether someone has a bony injury or not? And so a whole heap of physios and doctors sat down and did a massive brainstorm and went, these are the seven that we think are the most important. And so from I think it was 2008 through to 2013, we actually collected data on athletes around Australia that presented with chest wall pain and we did these seven tests on day one. So we got them in on the day, whether they're at the AIS or whether they're training in Tasmania with the national team, we got them in on, the day, on day one and we actually tested them every single day sequentially through to day seven to see what, what tests were positive. Yeah. So it's really quite lovely data. What we also did is um, we, if we were worried about um, the injury not improving, we scanned them so we actually got a definitive diagnosis as well. And at that stage, it was more often that we would do bone scans than MRs. MRs weren't as sophisticated at that stage as well. And we would follow up if it did come up as being positive with a very limited CT to see whether someone actually had a crack in the bone yeah. or, or not. So basically the seven tests that we picked were, does someone have night pain? Does someone have pain on activities of daily living? So picking up their bag, opening a doorknob, driving a car, that tends to be quite sensitive, which is quite interesting. Um, whether that's because you're leaning against a seat and also using the mm. steering wheel, I don't, I don't know. Um, deep breath, which you could see as a subjective test, but I use it as an objective test because um, certainly someone can take a deep breath and be up a chest breathing rather than deep yeah. and, and really expand the whole chest wall. Um, a cough, because you've got to take a whopping great bre breath in and then expel that air out. So there's a compressive load on, on the thorax. Um, a sit up, because again, there's this stabilizing load where you've actually got your back muscles and your anterior trunk muscles, you know, compressing the thorax, yeah. particularly the lower thorax. A push up, which is a whole lot more upper thorax compression and a rib spring. And we'll talk through how to do a rib spring in a moment as well. But um, essentially, when we collected that data, what we found is that those that ended up um, going on to have a diagnosis of bone stress or bone stress fracture at day five still had five out of seven positive tests. They weren't always the same ones, but five out of seven positive tests. Whereas those with chest wall pain had a, a whole lot less. They'd only have one or two left after five. And we sat down and went, okay, well, that's really interesting information. How are we going to figure out on day one or two whether someone's got anything? We just couldn't, we couldn't make any sense of any of the data. But when we looked at those that had chest wall pain, they all had modified training for about five to seven days. So we went, well, actually, if we make everyone have five days off the water, the bone stress related injuries are probably not going to get a whole lot better. Mm. Um, those that are thoracic referred are probably going to get a whole lot better over that time. We can yep. keep them training with cross training, but they could probably then return to training a whole lot quicker. So if we do that, would we return them a whole lot quicker anyway, which when we actually tested that out, we did. So they would usually have two or three weeks of modified training, trying to take anti inflammatories and keep training and keep loading. But if we gave them five days off, they're pretty much back to full training, somewhere between seven and 10 days. So we basically decided at that point when we collected this data, that if you present with chest wall pain, you get five days off the water or off rowing on an ergometer anyway. And that gives us a little bit of confidence doing the tests again at day seven as to whether we think you have a bony injury or not, and therefore how we can actually triage you from that point. How do you sell that to that uh, very eager sub-elite junior row, are you mm. saying we can take five days off to mm -hmm. save us two and a half days of wasting? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So basically, two and a half weeks, yeah, yeah, so yeah, so when when someone's in front of you, they don't, they don't want to take five days off the water. No. And if the head of the river is in two weeks time and they're, you know, um, looking at not making that boat for, you know, yeah. their, their main year 11 or, or 12 year, they're very reluctant to do that. But it's like, okay, well, the other option is we can keep you rowing. If it's bone stress, you're not going to be able to keep going. Yeah. Or we might tip it into bone stress fracture and then your season's over. Mm. Um, or we can actually have these five days off. Reassure your coach, you'll be fine. You'll be back at full training somewhere between seven and 10 days. You're going to be okay if it's not bone stress or, or, or bone yeah. stress fracture, which, you know, your season's over anyway. Um, but actually then you'll be rowing with no pain. So your performance is going to be a whole lot better anyway. So it's a whole lot easier Talk to sell in that regard. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right. Yeah. So these are the tests. So um, this, this first picture is just a deep breath. 
So it's getting someone to breathe in and really expand out their lower chest wall. So it's a really lovely big breath in. And it's positive or negative, it's nothing in between. Are you um, using any specific cues when you're getting them to do that? Yes, yeah, so I'm getting them to say, I'm gonna take you to get you to take the biggest breath in that you possibly can. You wanna feel your lungs right down into your lower rib cage. Okay. Yeah, and if they're not sure about how to do that, I'll put my hands on their lower rib cage. Yeah, perfect. Um, if someone has rib stress, often, they just don't expand out. They've got a lot of splinting and you, there's not a lot of movement in the chest wall. So there's some objectivity in looking at what they're doing as well, but basically it's either positive or negative. So and you'll be able to see if they catch their breath because of pain as well. Totally, that's right. So our first two tests are very much subjective. Have you got night pain? Have you got pain during activities of daily living? Yes or no. This third test is an objective test and we watch how they do it. The next one is a cough. So we basically big breath in, cough out, expel that air out. And if someone has a bone stress fracture, this hurts a lot, yeah. okay? It's not nice. It really is. So bone stress, not always, but a bone stress fracture, it hurts a lot, yeah. You get this big compressive load through your chest and often they'll be able to point to exactly where it is at that stage. Yeah, and I think yeah. the, the pointing there actually, I didn't think mm -hmm. of it, apologies, when we mm -hmm. came on to the differentials is these are mm -hmm. often young, growing, tall individuals, yep. and they could have a pneumothorax. Yes, absolutely. And so mm -hmm. if they're not pointing mm -hmm. vaguely, because yep. coughing with a pneumothorax yep. hurts. Yeah, absolutely as well. That's exactly right, yeah. And look, it's unusual to get a pneumothorax with a bone stress injury, whether it's stress fracture, um, or, or stress injury itself because it's on the outside of the lung. Yeah, oh really yeah. unusual. But if someone wants to continue to row with that and you've got a fracture all the way through both cortices, it's absolutely possible. Oh, possible, possible. But some of these tall <coughs> marfanoid mm. types can get the spontaneous totally ones. Totally, as well. That's correct. So here are two more tests. So this is a sit up to begin with and it's basically just coming from the ground and sitting up. And um, we're seeing it done repetitively here, but often you just need to do it once. Yeah. You know, does it hurt or not? What I would say from clinical experience is the athlete that has a posterior rib stress injury, when they lower back down on the ground, it hurts. So it doesn't actually hurt coming up, but when they got to lie back down, it hurts a lot. Yep. I like that info mm. behind the paper. Yep, beautiful. And this um, uh, push-up, basically you need to make sure that they're actually quite wide-armed, that if you're doing a tricep push-up, you can do that and just use your triceps yeah. and not get a lot of um, chest wall compression. The, the arms need to be wide. We need to be compressing the chest wall as we're doing it. This would be the most sensitive test. So right. almost everyone that has bone stress or bone stress fracture has a positive push-up. And if they've got a positive push-up on day five, high suspicion of yeah. bone. So this seventh test is a rib spring. And it's not a test that we would do for many other um, issues within the body, if you like. But the idea is you're prov providing some compression to the chest wall. If underneath your fingers you have rib stress, it's going to hurt. But um, essentially get the patient to take a big breath in and when they breathe out at the bottom of their breath out, you give them a spring on the side. And if it's anterior or posterior, it can often still be positive as well because you're adding that compressive load to the actual tissues. So again, it's just a positive or a negative test. So this next video shows how I will actually palpate the, the chest wall to try and figure out whether someone actually has a bone stress injury mm -hmm. or whether um, it might be coming from another source within the chest wall. So we'll just have a listen. Recording. Okay, so the places that you would palpate the thorax with regards to um, rib tenderness, if you like, are the armpit, the anterior lateral line, and if you suspect costochondritis, you also want to have a feel down through where the actual ribs connect onto the sternum itself. So what I tend to do to begin with is start in around the area that someone's got pain, identify a rib, and have a look at just going down through all the levels and seeing if that um, hurts. Certainly they're tender anyway, so I want to know if one is more tender than the other. If I find a rib that is a bit tender, I want to know, is it the spot that's, that I'm pushing that's tender, or is it that I've pushed the rib and it's tender? So then I'll actually work along the line of the rib and see if I can find a spot that is tender. Again, if the, if the patient or the athlete is talking more down through here, I'll probably start here and go down through the levels first to see what's going on. And then again, once you identify the level that's sore, you can work around the rib to see what it's like as you're going. The other thing that's useful is putting your fingers on each side of the rib and having a look at the intercostal space because when you've got pathology, often the intercostals are in spasm, so you'll find that the ribs are really close together and you can't get your finger into that space, and that's another sign that you may have some pathology around that area. From a costochondritis point of view, you wanting to have a look at where the rib is turning into cartilage and giving that a bit of a spring and seeing whether that's sore down through those costal margins. So not right on the sternum itself, 
but just off to the side to see what that's like. Have you got anything to add to that, Liam, with no. what you would do with examining the chess wall? No, I really like that. Um, something, I used to work in horse racing and we would have traumatic rib injuries. Yes, yeah. Um, where we were thinking they'd be um, more, let's say, mid-axillary would be just what we used to call an AP pressure. So yes. hand behind, so come either side, hand behind, hand in the stomach, if you pressed, yeah. thinking of the ring theory, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. if you press AP uh, and you get a sort of lateral rib pain, yep. you can start to think, well, what am I doing biomechanically and it's hurting there? Well, then you can ask them to point to it and then go and hone in. So I'd often start yeah. with that because mm -hmm. then they tell me where my area of interest is. Yeah, perfect, exactly. And then go and have that closer look. And, yeah. and that um, looking at where the ribs are in relation to each other is really helpful because the intercostals really do go into spasm and yeah. the ribs can be quite close together. And when I see that, I'm thinking this is probably not referred from the yeah. thorax. This is probably protecting pathology and splinting pathology either side of it. So it's yeah. a good, I think it's a good clue. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is palpation in a semi side lying position. And the reason why I palpate in this position rather than in prone is in prone you've already got this compressive force, force through your chest wall already and if someone has bone stress lying in prone is really uncomfortable so we had someone on the Australian rowing team with a decent rib injury when we were away that was actually sleeping in child's pose like you do in yoga to take the pressure off their chest wall it can be very exquisitely sore yeah. so you've got to make them comfortable to be able to relax so that you can actually examine them so this semi side lying position we'll have a bit of a listen to now as well so if someone has more posterior pain and you're trying to figure out whether someone has rib stress or whether they have any thoracic joint related issues, this is a really lovely position to get them in because if you're lying um, straight onto your belly and you're pushing through the rib cage, nearly everything is tender. So here you've got the shoulder blade out of the way because the arm is hanging over the edge of the bed, supported by a pillow or some towels on the outside. You can find the thoracic spine, go just out from that and you're working down through facet joints and then rib angles to see if anyone's sore. And certainly when, you, when you're mobilising your facet joint, you know, you're also putting some tension on the rib because the actual rib articulation to the thoracic spine is quite a stiff articulation. So even if the, thora if the facet joint, if you like, is, is tender or the rib angle, which you might be thinking is stressing the cross transverse joint is tender, you still can't rule out rib stress because you're stressing the whole segment, but it gives you an idea segmentally of what is your problem down through here. It's also a really lovely position to be able to get in and to do some soft tissue work to get rid of some muscle spasms through rhomboids, through traps, and even a bit through lats down through here. Lovely position as well. Once you've actually identified an area and you think it may be joint related to be able to mobilise through this area, whether that's through rib angle or whether that's through facet joint as well, without getting a lot of compression through the thorax. So yeah, that position's a really nice position for assessment, but it can roll onto treatment as well, which is really quite lovely.